I, I think one of the things that's blocking a fervent response to all the papal calls for a new evangelization, a new Pentecost, is this background thinking that, well, God's so merciful, everybody's mm -hmm. going to be saved, you know, I'm not a serial killer, none of my friends are, everything's, <laughs> everything's okay, you know, type of thing. And, and the truth is, is that uh, even in the Divine Mercy devotions, even, right, in, right. even in what... Yeah, you point that out in the book. Yeah, right, I have a whole right. chapter on, on what St. Faustina is really told by Jesus about Divine Mercy. And people hear about Divine Mercy and they kind of drift into a certain kind of presumption that, gee, I guess everybody's going to be saved. And that takes away the motivation for evangelization. And so what, what Jesus tells St. Faustina, and I have it right here. Okay, great. Yeah. It says, Jesus looked at me and said, souls perish in spite of my bitter passion. Mm -hmm. I'm giving them the last hope of salvation, the feast of my mercy. If they will not adore my mercy, they will perish for all eternity. Secretary right. of my mercy, write, tell souls about this great mercy of mine right. because the day of my justice is near. And there's lots of other on things. On page like 63 that. you were just reading. Yeah, yeah, right, and lots exactly. of other things. And then the Lord sent an angel to take her on a tour of hell because he, he said, you know, I want you to write this down mm -hmm. so nobody can say that nobody's been there and nobody can say what it's like. It's like the Lord wanted to plant right in the heart of the Divine Mercy Devotions a safeguard against presumption. Right, you right. Know, because it's so clear from everything that Jesus tells St. Faustina right. that God's mercy is absolutely great and we have to lead with mercy, but there has to be a response to mercy. There right. has to be a yes to mercy. There has to be uh, say, I need mercy. I need my sins forgiven. There has to be a yes right. to Jesus for mercy to actually be applied to our souls. And, and, and out of that comes a change in one's outlook, the way one lives their life, Ex all those exactly, other things. Exactly. You say some people have mistakenly gotten the impression from the helpful emphasis on mercy that sin is no big deal and that God in his mercy will never allow anyone to be lost. This is not at all what scripture and church teach, nor is it what the Lord showed to St. Faustina. Yeah. And you point that out as well in the Old and the New Testament that, right, by right, citing passages. Right, right. Right. There's no place in the New Testament where the offer of salvation is being made where it doesn't say that those who believe in him will become sons and daughters of God. There's, there's no time that Jesus shows mercy to people where he doesn't expect them to change their life. Like when the woman caught in adultery, you know, is anybody here to condemn you? No, I'm not going to condemn you either, but right. go and sin no more. So there has to be a response to mercy and a, a, a mm -hmm. receiving of it into our soul that leads to a change of life, that leads to repentance, that leads to following Jesus. Right. What kind of the world we live in today where, where can't we all just kind of get along? Yeah, yeah. Is that uh, that idea of why should I bother bothering my friends or bother or going out on a mission or spending my time doing something when this person's going to be fine anyway yeah. and you know they, they might be unhappy if I say these things yeah. to them. My court difficulties in my family. You know why should I bother? Yeah. Doug, that's really, that's really the key question. That's really the heart of the matter. Why bother? Is Christianity just an enrichment exercise? Is the Catholic Church <laughs> just something for people who like spirituality? Is, is Catholic Church just something for people who come from a certain ethnic background? Or is it like Jesus said, these are words of life. These, these are words that will actually bring us to eternal life, the rejection of which will cut us off from, from God's life forever. And uh, a lot of people say, well, hey, Ralph, you know, I know Jesus said stuff like that. I know all the saints say stuff like that, but didn't Vatican II change all that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and I have a whole chapter in the book here about what Vatican II actually teaches. And what it teaches is that it's possible under certain circumstances for people who through no fault of their own haven't really heard the gospel to be saved, but there's some real conditions on that. They right. have to be sincerely seeking God. They have to be living according to the light of their conscience and saying yes to the grace that God is giving them. But then it goes on to say, and people completely ignore these last three sentences in Lumen Gentium 16, that very often these conditions aren't met. Mm -hmm. Very often human beings exchange the truth for a God, God, the truth for a lie, worship the creature rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality, you know, the church is saying, let's not forget the reality that people are living in, that we're not living in neutral circumstances. We're living in a world where all of us have an inclination because of original sin to, to follow our disordered desires. All of us are living in a culture that's feeding us lies through the media 24 hours a day. All of us are li living in a world that Jesus tells us is under control of the evil one where mm -hmm. he works through deception. And so, you know, it says for the sake of people's salvation then, we urgently need to carry out our mission of evangelization. So Jesus says it, Thomas Aquinas says it, 
Vatican II says it. Right. Something's really resting on people's response or lack of response. And you know, Doug, that's that, that's absolutely right. That's another big lie that's gotten in there. You know, uh, you know, Jesus says, you know, the reason why you don't come to me is because you love the darkness more than the light. <clears throat> and under the surface of people saying I'm not responsible is actually a choice they're making really deep down. You know, so people are actually making choices under the surface. They don't even want to admit to themselves. And one of the things that's true about sin is that it has a guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that sin wants us to do is to agree with them that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And that there's tremendous pressure on us these days, like to, uh, to go along, to get along, you know, just like you said. There's tremendous pressure on us to agree with people that what they're doing is okay when it's not okay. It's not okay in terms of their own happiness. And it's not okay in terms of God's will for human life. And it's not okay in terms of what's going to happen to their eternal destiny if they right. persist in what's sin. And because there's been a selective kind of presentation of the gospel, a selective presentation of the Catholic faith, people have gotten a very distorted idea about who God is, about what his will for our life is, about where true happiness lies. And unfortunately, so many of our young people have gotten a very watered down uh, picture of, right. of, of this all. And so praise the Lord, like we were talking before the show mm -hmm. today, it just seems like there's a greater hunger and a greater mm -hmm. openness for people to hear the whole truth. Right. And, and, and th thanks be to God that God's giving us a chance to do it. Like, like Well, I think you know. if people can't find the truth in society, which they can't, ultimately they continue to mm -hmm. seek it and hopefully mm -hmm. they'll they haven't gotten that bad off in their own lives and had too much damage before they realized what the mm -hmm. truth is. But Ralph, I, I, you know, in chapter two, why bother on the bottom? I, I was reading this and I was thinking, well, why is Ralph so urgent and concerned? It says broad and wide is the way that leads to salvation in heaven. And almost everybody is on the way. Narrow and difficult is the path that leads to commendation, hell, and very few, if any, are on that road. Now that's right out of scripture, isn't it? Well, <laughs> close. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, that, that, that is, I think, a, a really that's wonderful... That's the scripture of the world we live in today. Yeah, think, that's right. a wonderful way of summing up <laughs> that where most Catholics have gotten in their heads about things is just like you said, this picture of broad and wide, that, you know, this is the way that leads to salvation, and almost everybody's heading that way, narrows the door that leads to hell, hardly anybody's going that way, and, and as we both know, that's the very opposite of what Jesus himself said in, in Scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said the very sobering words, broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door that leads to life, difficult the road, and few there are finding it. And this is not an isolated Scripture passage. I mean, in, in Luke chapter 13, people point blank ask Jesus, will there be few in number who are saved? And Jesus didn't give numbers, and I'm not going to give numbers, and I don't know what the numbers are. I know many are, are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. It looks like many are going to be lost, and what the proportion is is up to God. But what Jesus answered, them, they, they point blank they asked Jesus, will there be few in number who are saved? Jesus didn't say, hey, hey, chill, guys. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't get stressed about it. You know, that's just Jewish hyperbole. <laughs> don't you know about literary form? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, look, look at the, you know, look at, look at the historical critical analysis of this passage. You know, he didn't say that. What he said is try very hard to enter by the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. And then a couple of verses later, people say, oh, Jesus, no, wait a second. We were hanging out with you in the streets. We heard your preaching. You know, how can you say this? Sure. And Jesus said, I never knew you. Whoa. And then a couple of verses later, he says, it's not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, now these are challenging words. Mm -hmm. These are hard words, but these are said to us out of his great love and mercy because he wants us to be saved. Right. And in order to be saved, we actually have to pay attention to what he's telling us. Well, as that's, good, that's why it's as urgent. As a father, all good parents we know, uh, our responsibility is to have many times, and as the dad especially, to bring down the hard truth about certain things at times yeah. when people are not interested in yeah. hearing it. Yeah. You know? I do think that there's been an emphasis, Vatican II, on let's accentuate the positive. Let's talk about all the things we can affirm in modern culture. Let's say how much we're really actually in favor of science. We're actually in favor of democracy. We're actually in favor of human rights. And what that's led to is an unwitting silence about other aspects of the gospel, that there's actually some aspects of our culture that are not in harmony, God's will, you know, right. and that uh, we're not all just wonderful people kind of uh, saying yes to the light of our conscience, but 
people really need to be called to repentance and conversion. So that's been a little mm -hmm. underplayed. Uh, there hasn't been too much talk about the consequences of not responding to Jesus and, and, and the Catholic Church, that, that, that hell is real, you know, that there really is a heaven and that there really is a hell. And how we live and how we respond to the grace of God is really going to determine our eternal destiny. So some of the, we, we've emphasized the first part of the message. God loves us. Mercy is great. But we have two other parts that we've been pretty silent on. The second part is we need to make a response to mercy. We need to make a response to God's love. And then the third part of the message that's almost been completely silent on is that there's consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, if we respond, eternal life begins right now. If we don't respond, you know, like Jesus says in John chapter three, we're under condemnation. And the only way to not be under condemnation is to avail ourselves of the sacrifice of Christ. It is the core of, the new, of evangelization is bringing people to conversion, bringing people to surrender their life to Jesus Christ uh, and follow him as a disciple. And, and John Paul II gives a very striking definition, which I, which I have in the book, where he says what it means is to accept the savoring sovereignty of Christ by a personal decision. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like, you know, Billy Graham a little bit there. Right. It's mm -hmm. because sort of like the social situation has changed. We no longer have people absorbing the faith through osmosis. Christian culture, Catholic culture is collapsing. And so what used to kind of just be there because people were Irish or Hispanic or German mm -hmm. isn't there anymore in the same way. And so people now have to make a choice. They have to make a personal decision. Who do I believe? Who am I going to follow? How am I going to live my life? And so evangelization is calling people to that kind of relationship with Christ in the church. And, and when you say people and you talk about here, it's really even more so the lay people we're talking about, right? Right, right exactly. Uh, one, one of the things that's new about the new evangelization is who it's directed to. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we used to think of evangelization as happening in far off foreign countries where missionaries used to go to people who have never heard the gospel before. But now John Paul II and all the, all the recent popes are telling us, we now have a situation here. We have lots of people who are baptized Catholics, but have drifted away from the faith or are confused about the faith or don't show up at church anymore. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a tremendous decline, even in our lifetime, Doug, you know, from 40 or 50 years ago, like 72% Catholics went to church every Sunday. Now it's down to 23% average and it's lower and higher here and there. And so what we have a situation now is all kinds of baptized Catholics who have gotten confused about what it means. So the first thing that's new about the new evangelization is who it's directed to, mm -hmm. our fellow Catholics right. who are no longer living. And you really tie that into uh, coming out of Vatican II and the proper understanding, right, yeah. of the call of the lady. Because yeah. sometimes we had a little bit of a confusion between an apostolate and a ministry where it seemed to be the idea was everybody now is going to be participating up on the altar. Yeah. When really the call was for us to get go out the doors and spread the right. gospel. Right? right, right, exactly. So I say the second thing that's new about the new evangelization is who does it? And just like you said, it's us lay people. It, you know, right after Vatican II, like you mentioned, everybody thought, well, what it meant to be an engaged lay person is to, you know, join the parish council or be a Eucharistic minister or that type of thing. But now we realize that. What about the other billion Catholics? What are they going to do? We don't need that many Eucharistic ministers. And that's really what we uh, we hear from the present Holy Father, yeah. especially, is that idea of going out outside the yeah. parish. And one of the points you make in the book when you, you talk about Vatican II, saying that the pastor is responsible for all the Catholics in his parish, not just the ones who register his parish or show up at Mass. Yeah, it's really interesting. Canon law defines the role of the pastor as having a responsibility for the care of the souls of everybody within the geographic boundaries of the, of the, of the parish. And of course, it's impossible for him to do that himself. So right in canon law, it says, assisted by the lay faithful, evangelization should go out to all the people in the territory of the parish. So it's really important that us lay people awaken to mm -hmm. the fact that we are called to evangelization too. And that's one of the big emphasis of Vatican II. We, we have a whole document in Vatican mm -hmm. II devoted to us lay people. And, and the way it begins is saying that lay people don't have to wait for their pastor or bishop to ask them to do something. Jesus has already asked them, mm -hmm. you know, but just by virtue of, of being a baptized Catholic. Right. Every single Pope from St. John the 23rd all the way up to uh, Pope Francis has said we, we desperately need the Holy Spirit. We desperately need a new Pentecost. Most people don't realize how insistent and how fervent the calls of the popes have been for a new Pentecost. So I go through that, mm -hmm. all that in the chapter, but everybody needs to open themselves as, as fully as possible right. to the power of the Holy Spirit because we can know the truth in our heads, you know, just like the, the disciples did before Pentecost. You know, 
before Pentecost, the disciples had the best Bible teacher anybody ever had. You know, Jesus did Bible studies with them. You know, they had the best pastoral supervision. They had the best spiritual direction. But it didn't all come together mm -hmm. in their lives until they opened their lives to the power of the Holy Spirit. So after Pentecost, they got really excited about Jesus. Like, you know, right. they, 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 they and, wanted to tell their people about it. It also him. seemed like there was a courage yeah, that was now exactly. suddenly there. The yeah. ability to go out at risk and not be afraid anymore yeah. to speak the truth. Yeah, right? so lots of Catholics are afraid. Or, or timid, don't have an interior conviction that it's really useful for other people to know Jesus. Well, exactly, and that's why with the challenges that's happening right now to the church, you know, it's getting, you know, there's more and more pressure on us to shut up about Christ, mm -hmm. you know, to shut up about Just at the teaching. time when we need to speak up. Yeah, and this is a time when we really need the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the courage right. and the confidence. Right. Like at, at the Synod of World Bishops on New Evangelization that I was at about a year and a half ago, uh, Cardinal World said that the number one priority for us as a church is to recover our confidence in the truth of our message. You know, we need to really be convinced that this is the most precious and important thing that anybody can ever know, mm -hmm. and that the one thing really necessary for people to know is that Jesus Christ can forgive their sins, can save them from the second death, can, you know, rescue them from the deception of the evil one and bring them to heaven. But yeah, well, I think, I think that we have come out of some time in the church that some people still remember or have heard about, which was maybe a little legalistic mm -hmm. or rules-oriented. These are the rules you got to keep. And, and there wasn't an undergirding of the, the beautiful picture of God's love and, and, and the amazing thing that Jesus has done for us. So like Pope Francis is saying, he says, lead with the good news, lead with the love of God, lead with the awesome sacrifice of Christ, and then these other more difficult issues can come in right. after you know who Jesus is, after you know that he's founded the church, then his teachings begin to make sense. Do you think the problem was also in some ways in, in reading about Vatican II is that the first part they got, let's be very welcoming, but the idea that we're bringing you in so we can bring you along the path yeah. went away. It became, thank you for coming. You're wonderful the way you are. That's, that's really great, Doug. And this reminds me of something Cardinal Dolan had said. He said, everybody's welcome in the Catholic Church, but not anything goes. Right, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, right. everybody's But that's welcome. what some people think. Yeah, everybody's think, you know, and, and, they, and they've been told that. You know, you know, they've been told that God accepts you just as you are. He accepts you just as you are with the purpose of bringing you into the right. purpose for which he created you. He, he's, he's leading you to transformation. He doesn't love you so little that he's going to leave you where you are. Mm -hmm. Repentance is life-giving. It's turning away from things that we think will make us happy but are actually wounding our souls and bringing us further away from true happiness. Repentance is, is you know, there used to be a little book one time written titled Repentance, the Joy-Filled Life. It's so good to turn away from things that are false, from things that are wrong, from things that really may bring temporary uh, relief of, of, of whatever, but isn't leading us to lifelong happiness. So repentance is a, is a blessing that God gives us, a blessing that he's calling us to. Holiness isn't a burden he's trying to place mm -hmm. on us. It's a blessing he's trying to give us. We're with Ralph Martin, live from the Catholic Leadership Conference. His new book, The Urgency of the New Evangelization, Answering the Call, and it's published by our Sunday Visitor, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.